Well, we come to three minor prophets, the last prophets to speak for God to Israel, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And after that, God didn't say another thing for over 400 years. And for four centuries, they had to tell their children, someday God will speak to us again. But he just went dumb for 400 years. It's a long time not to hear from someone you love. But uh, that's what happens. So we're getting to the very last part of the Old Testament when we look at Haggai and Zechariah particularly. There was only one further one after that and then God just was finished talking to Israel until John the Baptist appeared 400 years later. No wonder everybody went out to hear John when you've waited 400 years to hear a prophecy and you finally hear that God is speaking again. Boy, it's no wonder the whole country went to listen. But... They had some last words from Haggai particularly. Now these are very short books because these prophets spoke for a very short time. Haggai only spoke for three months. Then he was finished. Zechariah was a bit longer. He was two years. And they actually overlapped. Zechariah started before Haggai finished. But they just uh, said a little, but a very important little. Whereas Isaiah and Jeremiah had preached for 40 to 50 years, now they just spoke a matter of months. They are what we call post-exilic prophets. They came after the exile. They were part of the coming home again. And that's the background to both Haggai and Zechariah. Before the exile, the prophets were full of warnings and uh, disasters coming. But afterwards, it's quite different. They are full of encouragement, of comfort, trying to get the thing built up again. And so the message is quite different. Now, Haggai and Zechariah are, are among the very last, but they go together, and there are many similarities between them. First of all, they spoke at the same time. Both of them carefully dated their prophecies, which few of the other earlier prophets had ever done. But they actually date them to the day and the month and the year when they said things. So each prophecy of Haggai, and he gave five, each has a date, an exact date. So we can see just how many days or weeks there lay between each of them. And same with Zechariah. They overlapped by just one month, and the year is 520 BC. They're back in the land, but it's a rather depressing picture. They both spoke in the same place, the slow rebuilt city of Jerusalem in Judah. And they both spoke to exactly the same situation. Now, I must give you a bit of history just to help you to see what was happening. The Persian Cyrus, or Cyrus as we should call him, conquered Babylon in 538 BC. And because he was such a, a better dictator, more benevolent one, a humane man, he said all those who were taken from their country can go back provided you build a temple in which you can pray to your God for me. So that he was not entirely disinterested in this, but nevertheless, it made it possible for Jews, among others, to return to their home. But only 50,000 did so. And the rest, having largely been born in exile, having established themselves, they weren't slaves in Babylon. They were allowed to trade. And Babylon was right on the main river there and was a trade route, and the Jews are good at trading and making money. And they became quite wealthy, and they had businesses that depended on the trade route through Babylon. There was no trade route through Jerusalem. So I'm afraid many of them said, we're staying. This is what keeps Jews, or kept them in Germany and Poland, up to World War II. This is what's keeping them in America. They're better off. And many Jews who came out of Russia recently didn't go to Israel, though that's why they came out of Russia. They went straight off to New York because they're better off there. And there are Jews leaving Israel today and going to live in America. And you wonder how long they'll be there without trouble before God says, you've got to go back. Anyway, only 50,000 came. The rest stayed. There was a huge Jewish colony in Babylon from then on. And as I've told you already, it was from that colony that wise men saw the star that Balaam the prophet had predicted and came to Bethlehem to see the Messiah. Now those who did come back were led by two men. One was a prince, 
Zerubbabel. And that name means seed of Babylon. Babel, Babel, Babylon, same word. And Zeru means seed. So it's clear that he'd been born in exile. He'd never seen the promised land, but he was the only surviving member of the royal line of David. So he had to go back. And the man who accompanied him was a priest called Joshua, a descendant of Ido. And Joshua re-established the priesthood. Joshua is the same name as Jesus. Yeshua, Yeshua, same word. It means God saves. God our saviour. And so Joshua went back to re-establish the priesthood in the temple. Those who came back were primarily motivated by spiritual interests. They certainly weren't motivated by any commercial attraction. They were not going to be wealthy. It was going to be a hard struggle. They were going back to a land that hadn't been cultivated for 70 years. They were going back to a city in which the, there was not a wall standing. They were going back into a place where the people who had survived there didn't want them. They were called Samaritans. They were half Jewish. But the few Jews who'd managed to stay in the Promised Land married non-Jews, and it became a kind of half-caste race. And they were regarded both by the Jews and the locals much as coloreds were regarded in South Africa. Hybrids. You don't fit either. And that's the beginning of the Jewish-Samaritan hatred of each other. Why Jesus told such an offensive story about a good Samaritan helping a Jew. That really got under their skin. So the Samaritans were living there and they didn't want the Jews to come back. And so it was not a very promising future. But their first concern on going back was to build an altar. And their second concern was to build a temple around it, to re-establish themselves as God's people. That's why so many priests, it was actually two out of every 15 were priests who went back. Now, do you realize they were tracing the exact same route that Abraham had gone? Because Ur of the Chaldees, where Abraham had lived, is just down the river from Babylon. And they were going to have to repeat the whole story of Abraham again and leave their home and leave their relatives and leave their business and go out to a country they'd never seen and they would take exactly the same route that Abraham took. And the first thing that Abraham did when he got to the promised land, he pitched his tent and raised an altar. Wherever that man went, he put up his tent and the next thing he got some stones together and made an altar and gave a sacrifice of thanksgiving to God that he'd safely arrived. And that was the first thing they did when they went back. The very first step in Jerusalem was to gather a few of the stones and make an altar and thank God for getting them back. The next thing was to get the temple built, put a building. And because there were few of them and they had no resources, they decided to build a very much smaller temple. Just a little one. But at least it was a temple. And they laid the foundations, this little square building around the altar. Now, all this had involved great sacrifice. They'd left friends, relatives. They'd left brick-built homes for temporary accommodation and tents. They'd left prosperity for poverty. They'd left trading for agriculture. They must now learn to dig again. It was a very costly business, but they had their dream. And their dream from the book of Chronicles was of re-establishing a royal kingdom with their own king and to be again a people of God in the land God had promised their forefathers. But the good old days did not come back. The dream faded. Fantasy gave way to reality. And the size of the task discouraged them and their hearts sank. The opposition of the local people, the Samaritans, to their return was very strong. And the subsidy Cyrus had given them, financial help, to go back and rebuild. And that stopped when Darius replaced Cyrus and uh, got involved in wars which were expensive. And the first economy he made was to cut off the subsidies that had been given to returning peoples to build temples. So they now found themselves out of that money. So they stopped building after only two years. And for 14 years, they didn't put another stone on the temple. Just 
the foundations were in and low walls. But that was all. And after two years they gave up. They hadn't the money. They were struggling to stay alive, to scratch a living from the poor soil. And it was just too much. On top of scratching a living to be building temples, that was a luxury they couldn't afford. Their concern now was mere survival. Then their economy went into severe recession. Food became scarce and very expensive. Inflation rocketed. And bad harvests reduced the supply of food. Droughts and disease hit the corn. They had no savings. They'd spent all the money they'd saved in Babylon on just food and clothing. It was a huge anticlimax. Everything had gone wrong. They'd come home with these hopes of rebuilding a nation and now they could hardly stay alive. And of course they discussed the question, why has it turned out like this? And they came up with their own answers. They hadn't been wrong to return, but they had chosen the wrong time. And they began to say we should have stayed longer in Babylon and built up more money for ourselves and uh, waited until we were fit enough to come back and uh, could come back in strength and come back with wealth and, and then we could have done it. But we chose the wrong time. We're not in the wrong place, but we chose the wrong time to come. We're having to overstretch ourselves. We should have been established as a people first when we'd multiplied and prospered and uh, though Abraham may have been content with a tent and an altar. We're not. We want to rebuild. They'd been back 18 years and had so little to show for it. Now I'm trying to depress you. I want you to feel the depression they were in. And that's when Haggai spoke to them. He'd come back with them from exile. I think he was probably a priest, but we don't know who his father was, so he wasn't a very important person. Important people knew who their father was. It is not poetry, it's all prose. Now that is very significant because there are no feelings of God come through at all. It's as if God is fed up, as if he doesn't feel anymore. That's very significant. But the word of the Lord came, not to Haggai as to other prophets, but by Haggai which means that it was a word of insight rather than revelation, that he saw what was really wrong and why the dream had collapsed and why it was all so depressing. He could see it. But he brought word after word from the Lord, 26 times in just 38 verses, thus saith the Lord. And he brought the word of the Lord to them in this second shortest book in the Old Testament. There are actually, these are the messages which he brought. I've even put the dates on them. Uh, that was in the first of the sixth month, in the second year of Darius. That's in the 24th of the same month. And then the 21st of the seventh month. Then the 24th of the ninth month. And finally, again, on the 24th of the ninth month. Five days, that's all. And yet he brought uh, 26 words from the Lord over five days. And they grouped around certain things. And he came asking questions. Chapters 1 to 3 are all about questions from the Lord. The Lord questions the people. He makes them think. Because the real problem is that their thinking has gone wrong. And when your feelings are depressed, it's usually because your thinking has gone wrong. You're thinking the wrong way. You need to revise your thoughts and then your feelings will follow. You need to think again. But it's amazing, God's people don't like to think. I'm sorry, but the most common, the most common comment I get after I preach is, well, you gave us something to think about. <laughs> and it's always said in a tone of mild rebuke, as much as say, I didn't come to church to think. You know? But in fact, sometimes preachers and prophets need to make people think and provoke them to think again and to ask questions. And that's how Haggai tackled the situation. And he said, basically, your thinking is all wrong. Now, I've given you a very simple outline of the five days of his preaching. I'm just going to go through them now and pick out some of these questions that he asked on behalf of God. He was trying to get them to rethink. You see, they had come up with this answer that in fact uh, God had caused this disaster, this disappointment, and they were suffering from it. But actually it was the other way around. 
They had caused it. God was simply responding to them. They had actually taken the first steps into this depression, into this recession, into this time of inflation. He says, now your food is short and your money's short. You put your money into a bag with holes and it just seems to go. That's a vivid phrase. In time of inflation and recession, that's exactly how people feel. You put your money in your pocket and it's not there. Put in a bag with holes and your food, your crops have failed. And you've come to the conclusion that it's the wrong time to build the temple, that you can't afford the energy or the money to build them. He said, actually, all this happened because you stopped building the temple. It was the other way around. You shouldn't be saying we can't afford to build the temple in this time of inflation. What caused the inflation? It was you stopping building the temple. As soon as you stopped putting God first and his house first, that's when things began to go wrong, but you didn't notice. And so it was, you know, was the hen or the egg first? Which was the cause, which was the effect? And they were thinking exactly the opposite way. And so he said, now give careful thought to your ways. Think about what you did. And it was you who stopped building the temple first. And then he really began to attack them because he says, look at your houses. Wood panelling. Now you must realise that when they went back, wood was very scarce. The trees had all been chopped down by the Babylonians and they had to import wood from places like Lebanon where there were cedar trees. And so a person with a sealed house, that was something. A person with a panel dining room, they're spending a lot on their own house. And he's saying each of you is living in an ideal home. He said, look at your houses and what you've spent on them and look at God's house. Walls only up this high. You're more concerned about your own house than his house. That's what's caused the recession. That's why God isn't blessing your house. That's why inflation is running away with your money. You're not putting God first. It's a very simple message. He says, just compare your own home with God's home. And that'll tell you where your priorities have been. Well, that message had a real effect. They really responded positively. They said, come on lads, let's build the temple. And he really was a successful prophet where the prophets before the exile were largely failures. The prophets afterwards seemed to have been listened to. They'd learned their lesson in the exile. And so they got going and as soon as they did, Haggai's last word to them on that first day word was, thus says the Lord, I am with you again. Off we go. And so they stood up, they took a little time uh, three and a half weeks to get the builders organized and to get more material for the temple. But three and a half weeks later, they were off and building. The second message comes the 21st of the seventh month, just 27 days after they began building, less than a month later. And now morale was declining largely through old people talking. It's so very human, this. It says the old people are saying, it's nothing like the temple in my day. <laughs> you know? There were old people who'd come back who remembered the previous temple. They said, it's a poor little thing, isn't it? Call this a temple, you should have seen the temple we had. Now, this kind of encouragement <laughs> really is devastating. It's not like it was in my day. You know, you look back through rose-coloured spectacles anyway. You can't trust elderly people talking like that to be remembering correctly sometimes. But uh, that's what they were doing. And it was terribly discouraging. And it was undermining the work. And Haggai had to speak again from the Lord to keep them building. And he said, don't despise the day of small things. Better begin small than not at all. Let's get a temple up. God's not so worried about the size of his house. He just wants a house to live in where he can dwell among his people. So don't despise the day of small things. Lovely message, isn't it? And he got them going again. And he made promises. And again, he said in the name of the Lord, I am with you. My spirit remains with you. And uh, also he gave a message three times. He said, be strong. And once he said, and don't be afraid. 
And we've made a chorus out of that, haven't we? Be strong, for I the Lord, be bold, for I the Lord am with you. That's straight out of Haggai's second little message. Some of these choruses really pick up these messages, but unfortunately we sing them and we don't remember when they were given. And we need the context to understand the real meaning of these songs. Then he talked about the future in the second uh, day he spoke to them. He talked about the future that God would shake the heavens and the earth and shake the nations, that he was in tr control of nature and history. And then a very strange and difficult verse to translate comes up, and the desire of all nations will come. Now I'm afraid too many think that's the promise of the Messiah, the desired of all the nations will come. It's a very difficult bit of Hebrew, but I'll tell you what I think it means. That word desired is usually translated in the Old Testament as valuables, as treasures which you desire. And I think it's a promise that further silver and gold will come and help to restore the temple to its original condition. It's saying the treasures of the nations will come. I'm going to shake the nations and they'll send their treasures here. And in fact that happened because shortly after that prophecy, a whole wave of silver and gold came from Babylon, or from Persia as it was now, to help with the rebuilding. So I think that's what it means. We read too much into it if we think that means the Messiah will come. And then God says, I will fill this house with my glory. And the glory of this house will be greater than the glory of the former house. And in fact, ultimately it was, because during Jesus' day, that second temple was rebuilt by Herod. And it became the most magnificent temple the world had ever seen. Though it was never actually finished, even in Jesus' day. But God was really saying, it's my glory that will make this house beautiful. And the glory of this later house, this second temple, will be greater than the former, the first temple. So with all these uh, promises, Haggai kept them going. And then the next crisis came two months later. Because a problem arose... It was now two months later into December and there was no rain. Now you see, Haggai had said, you caused this drought and the famine and the shortage of food because you stopped building the temple. And now they came back to him and said, now we're building the temple again. We've been building it for two months, three months. There's no rain. Now rain is expected in October. That's the early rain. And it hadn't come still by December. And they're saying, hey, just a minute, you said everything would go right when we started rebuilding. And we've rebuilt so much. Look, we're getting the roof on now. And God hasn't sent the rain. It's going to be another bad harvest. Now, this is a bit of a problem for Haggai. You can imagine there's a theological problem here. He said, this needs careful thought. Three times he said it. And then he said, there must be a reason why God hasn't responded immediately to your rebuilding. There must be a reason. He said, God, what's the problem? And God told him. And he went with new questions to the people. He said, tell me, if you put a stack of dirty plates with a stack of clean plates, do the clean plates make the dirty plates clean? Or do the dirty plates make the clean di plates dirty? Nice little question. What's the answer? If you put dirty and clean things together, do the dirty things make the clean things dirty or do the clean things make the dirty things clean? You know the answer? Right. And then he said, and here's another question. If a thing is consecrated to the Lord and you put it with something unconsecrated, does the consecration pass over from the consecration to the unconsecrated? The answer is no. And then he said, now if you think about that, you've got the answer to why God hasn't put the harvest right. He said, you're building a consecrated temple, but unconsecrated people are doing it. Dirty people are building a clean temple, and that's making this new temple dirty in God's sight. He said, the real problem is you think you're godly because you're building a temple, but actually you're not godly people. And you're contaminating the temple in God's sight. 
because you're not putting your lives right. And they got the message. And they began to clean themselves up. We don't know what the sins were. Haggai didn't mention them, but they knew. They knew what he was talking about. They knew what they were doing secretly and on the side. And God said, I don't want dirty people building my clean temple. That's what's wrong. And they put it right, and the rain began the next day. <laughs> Haggai was a good prophet, you know. He really got through with his sermons, or rather with his questions, and he really got them going. And the rain started, even though it was December. And the word from the Lord was, from this day I will bless you. Because they got the message. The fourth day was the 24th of the ninth month. And this time it was a message for Zerubbabel and for him alone. And the message was, you are the signet ring of God. The signet ring is always worn by royalty. And what uh, God was saying is Zerubbabel, from you the royal line will be re-established. He was the prince in David's line. But of course he couldn't ever be king because under the Persian king nobody else was allowed to be a king. They could be governor. And so Zerubbabel was made the governor of Judah under the king of Persia, now Darius. But he couldn't be king. But the promise was made in this, uh, where are we now, the fourth message over here on the 24th of the ninth month, the promise was made to Zerubbabel but there'll come a day when I shake the nations and when I shake them, I will establish, I'll overthrow their thrones and I'll establish the throne of Israel. And your line will be on it. I'm into number five, sorry. Yes, I am. All right. So he promises to Zerubbabel that he will shake the foreign nations, he will shake Persia, Egypt, Syria, Greece and even Rome. And he will re-establish the kingdom of Israel from Zerubbabel's line. And on that day, on that day, he says, I will take you and I will make you my signet ring, which the king always uses to seal documents. For I have chosen you. Now, this was never actually fulfilled for Zerubbabel himself, but there is an extraordinary thing that happens when you study the genealogy of Jesus. There are two genealogies of Jesus, and it's a problem to some people. They seem to contradict each other, but one is of Joseph in Matthew, and one is of Mary in Luke. But these two family lines, which both went back to David, separated after David, and they came together again in one man, Zerubbabel, and then they separated again. Isn't that interesting? So that, in fact, the name which appears in both Joseph's genealogy in Matthew 1 and in Mary's genealogy in Luke 3 contains this special name. Ancestor of Jesus on both his father's and his mother's side, as David was ancestor on both his father and mother's side. So Zerubbabel has a very, very important place in the history of our salvation. And God fulfilled his promise to that man by putting him on both sides of the genealogy of his son. I've told you already that Jesus traced his legal line back to David through his father, stepfather Joseph. He traced his physical line back to David through Mary. So he had this double claim, but the claim went, both claims went back through this man as well. Do you ever notice that? Read the two genealogies. I think that's a lovely thought. The message of Haggai may be summed up very quickly. First things first. And particularly put God first. And that theme is taken up by Jesus again and again in his teaching. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And matters like food and clothes you won't need to worry about. All these things will be added to you. But you know, so often we say it's, it's just so much keeping body and soul together in life. I really don't have time for religion. I, I've, I just have got to work so hard to just keep alive. But you know, the best welfare state ever is the kingdom of heaven. Because Jesus said, you seek the kingdom first, put God first. 
and all these other things will look after themselves. He doesn't promise us luxury. He promises that everything we need will be supplied. As a little boy reciting Psalm 23 said, the Lord's my shepherd, that's all I want. <laughs> and it is true. When it says the, Lord's, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, that means I shall not need. It doesn't mean I, I'll get everything I want. We, we're not promised that, but we are promised that if we put God first, he looks after the requirements of life, the necessities of life. That's a promise. But so often we tend to put making a living or keeping alive first, and God can have what's left. But that's not the way it works. And Haggai's message comes through to us very clearly. If you put your own house before the house of God, <laughs> it won't work out. God must come first. And then the other things will be provided. There's a more important aspect too. God is concerned about not what we do for him, but whether we're clean to do it. Or whether we're contaminating even the good things we're doing for him. Because we're not keeping clean ourselves. That's why Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, when you bring an offering to the Lord, and there's a brother that you need to be reconciled to, you better go and put that right first before you bring the offering to the Lord. Once again, Haggai's message is coming through. Dirty people can make clean things dirty. <laughs> get things right. Put God first. Get things right. And then God can welcome what you do for him and bless you and look after you. It's a really quite a simple message, but it's a message that perhaps still needs to be made. It's not staying alive or making a living. It is living right and living for God. Thank you, Haggai, for reminding us of that. And praise God, the people listened. And they put it right. And they got on with rebuilding the temple of the Lord. But one month before Haggai finished, another message was needed. And this time another man came, Zechariah. And we look at him next time.